It's just totally... Yeah, a wind-powered air pump. Oh, yeah, or you could do solar-powered air pumps. But uh, we're, we're going to do some mechanical air pumps here as well because we have this wind. So we have a windmill that's going to be going in here, a Whisper 400, whenever we pull it together. But that will create so much power for us right here. In the future, we're going to have a, the area right here, we'll have a little shade cloth with our aquaponic systems. And we're going to have a little stove set up so that we can come out here and we can all cook together and maybe kind of have fun with this every time you guys come too. Yeah. Not, not, hopefully it won't be so boring as this every time. Yeah. 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 Just a question. Um, on a smaller scale, if you don't have the stones or anything like that, and you want to compost, and you want to do it quick, you say in a couple weeks, can you just throw it on the on the ground and just rake it and let the, and, and keep mixing it every day? Is that a good way? You to could, but you don't want the sunlight on it so much. So oh. what you could do is you could cover it with a tarp. Right. Mix your mix a higher nitrogen to ratio, uh, carbon ratio in it, and then every two or three days, once it started, if you flip it every day, it's going to keep cooling off before it gets hot enough to do anything. Oh. So you're going to have to leave it for three or four days, let it heat up, get really hot. In a bucket then when it, then when it's out. at its hottest. Flip right. it and move it around so it mixes up better and you get the oxygen in with that heat. Or and just so it, leave it in a bucket and pour it out? Uh, you can leave it in a bucket and pour it out and pour it back in to a certain extent. But what's easier is a lot of those composters they have that just spin in a circle. Yeah. Uh, Rob and Ashley have a really nice one at their house they got from the Home Depot. Seals up real nice. Uh, it's pretty good size. You stick all your stuff in there at the right ratios and you just spin it every couple of days. And every time you add something in, inside of it. Those work really well for faster compost is that spinning process. Right. They don't work real well for worms in those kind because you're crushing worms and beating right. them off. Worms like compost that doesn't move. So, so if you don't have that, you can just put it on the ground, cover it, and every couple days turn it. Right, and if you stack a pile the right way, all you really got to do is put it on the ground and walk away. And if you maybe once in a while put a little bit of water on it. If you're in a right spot where it rains a little bit, that's all Mother Nature does. She piles all her leaves up under the tree, it rains, the worms come up, compost right underneath the tree. So in nature, a tree that produces fruit never needs to be fertilized in nature because a tree produces fruit, all the shell, all the leaves drop to the tree, that gets composted back in, the worms bring extra along with that, eat the leftover from that, they get fed, they fertilize the tree. What's going on nowadays is we see a tree, we're raking all the leaves away from the tree, we're pulling all the fruit away from the tree, it's got nothing to replenish itself in the circle. So eventually, you know what I mean, it's not going to keep up its circle. So that's what we're thinking is everything that we take out, we kind of put back in one way or another. You know, uh, if, if the, uh, you know, the landscape people and the gardeners, if they'd all get that, it would actually be less money spent on raking and cleaning up. Amen, and sister. If they would just allow it to be a little more natural in the state that it's mother nature intended, it would be perfect. Well, but I don't know, I guess they're, they're really not that long, really short. I think we're so conditioned that most people I talk to, really, honestly, I've been preaching this to people for years and years and years, and most people like the idea of it, but they don't want to inconvenience themselves. It really, basically, to me, comes down to two ways to wealth, acquire more or desire less. Yeah. Um, and if you acquire SUVs and everything that you need, well, I'm not, not no, no, nobody's oh, SUVs, <laughs> but whatever it is you need that you think is easy or you want to throw miracle Grow soil in your yard because it's easy to go get a bag, or if you don't want to look at leaves under your tree because it messes up your patio, you can take those leaves from under your tree, put them in a compost pile, bring that compost back under your tree. And There's have a ways. Tree. Right. So it's about education. You know that there are ways to do it, and you can have your cake and eat it too. You know, you can still run your, I mean, you can basically grow your corn and still drive your SUV and run it on corn oil. I mean, whatever, you know what I mean? So it's really about us looking for the solutions and the answers, and they're already all right here. We just got to change our mindset a little bit. Right now, we're all into convenience. Everything's put right in front of us all the time. And we Most want of us, it fast. Yeah, we want it fast. We want instant gratification. Big, fast and now. Yeah, and no, most people don't really know where their food is coming from. They don't have a clue. They've never seen it in the ground. Right. So if we can get an idea literally where our food's coming from, from the bottom up, that we're actually creating the dirt, we're going to grow it in, that we're going to take so much pride. By the time we're eating the vegetables we're pulling out of here, we're all going to feel really good about it. I know that. So, and then maybe we're all ambassadors rubbing off on each other and all of our neighbors because we're all seeing, hey, I don't have to use that, or yeah, my leaves are still there under that my tree. I didn't haul them all to the dump. Really cool. You guys are on the really beginning of it, the core of it here. This place is going to be beautiful in a few months, like unbelievably so. 
right? You can't tell a lot. It, no, I agree. It is beautiful, and you have to be able to see that. But I just mean, as it grows, and as the aesthetics, the flowers and the fruit trees and everything starts to take hold, and the dirt starts to get really softened up and not just stuck to our feet as mud, and you start to see the changes that take place once the worms start to spread out, um, you guys are probably going to get the, the best education out of anybody, because there's going to be a lot of other people that are going to come once it's grown and want to be a part of it. But they're going to miss a lot of the very integral stuff in the, from the bottom up of it coming up. Okay. Nutrient balance. This is a short one, folks. What Eddie was saying earlier about adequate phosphorus, potassium, and trace uh, minerals such as calcium, iron, boron, copper, etc., are essential to microbial metabolism. Normally, these nutrients are not limiting because they are present in ample concentration in the compost source materials. And the last little bit in this article it regards pH, which, as we all know, is the relative acidity or Nutrient balance, adequate phosphorus, potassium, and trace minerals. Phosphorus and potassium, we've already talked about. Nitrogen is the whole thing that's heating it up. So where's your phosphorus and your potassium going to come from in that compost? They're going to say whatever you're putting into there is usually adequate and has it in it because it's had enough to grow it to get that size. So that's what it's in already, right? So um, what we're trying to do is take it another step from there. Instead of just throwing random compost of any food scraps or this or that and just looking for nitrogen and phosphorus, we're going to look for trace minerals. We're going to look for phosphorus and we're going to look for potassium that are present in the plant already. Because when it's present in the plant and it's broken down, it's the easiest for other plants to assimilate it. Rather than us throwing milk in for compost, for calcium, we're going to throw a plant that has a lot of calcium in it. It's going to break down and be assimilated a lot easier um, into the, the plant. Um, so what happens is the same things that are important for us to feed that our plants that are going to give us the nutrients are absolutely um, necessary in composting. These little microbes, that's their food source. They need their vitamins before they can break the stuff down. So that translates into those vitamins going directly into the plants again. Um, so again, what we're trying to put in our compost, banana leaves high in uh, potassium. Uh, water plants high in nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Uh, column and guy, potassium, and phosphorus. So we're basically trying to make super compost demos by really paying attention to what we put in it rather than just randomly composting anything. You can have a pile of composted leaves, which is great. It's great compost, but it's not going to be near as, as superior as something that you put all the right ingredients in and compost it in, and you have a... a a uh, concentrated source of minerals and potassium and phosphorus and nitrogen. So that's what we're breaking, coming into mind with, right? A pH between 5.5 five and 8.5 is optimal for compost microorganisms. Usually somewhere around 6, something like that. And it's also in our soil here, around 6 or 7. 5.5 uh, to 7 is our, is our ideal, adequate um, acidicness in our soil as well. That, 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 that's what we have here, or that's what we're after here? That's, that's what we're after right here, and we were pretty low. We were at like four. Oh. But what happens is compost will bring that up right off the bat and balance the pH. And what we're doing with the humic acid and the worms here and the composting, by the time we take a soil sample here again, it's going to probably be through the roof already, just with everything that we have going on here. And every plant that you grow in the ground, increases more organic material which changes the pH. It's just when it sits and everything's been sucked out of it and it's already acidic or alkaline. So what would you say the, the land's raw as uh, empty plot? What would you say that pH is? I think it was tested as a uh, four point oh, really? four I want to say on the soil test that I seen in the beginning. Over here when I first came it was about a four four, four okay. three, four four. Okay. Um, and that's now um, I'm about ready to test near those piles over there, but I don't really want to yet. I want things to spread out a little further and get a lot more plant material in. Bacteria and fungi digest organic matter. They release organic acids in the early stages of composting. These acids often accumulate. The resulting drop in pH encourages the growth of fungus to break down the lig lignin and cellulose. Usually the organic acids become further broken down during the composting process. If the system becomes anaerobic, if the system becomes anaerobic. However, acid accumu accumulation can lower the pH to 4.5, se severely limited microbial activity. In such cases, aeration is usually sufficient to return the compost pH to acceptable ranges. That's where oxygen comes in. You can, you can change that out. For us, okay, our soil is 4.5. What are we going to do to our soil? 
oxygen. We're adding oxygen. Exactly. That's it right there. Why are we adding oxygen? We're adding it in the form of aerobic bacteria. Ox oxygen aerobia that um, bacteria that thrives in oxygen and actually creates oxygen in a sense through its um, process of decomposing rather than like um, sulfate gases and different gases that the compost pile will put out.